upload this. Yeah, recording in progress. Thank you. Like I said, we're going to be discussing about port state control today. And for UK candidate, especially when they ask what is uh, what they understand by port state control, we always start by giving them where we will find these regulations from and from the UK M notice M -M MSN 1832, you will find um, guidance and what are the requirements for postage control. But what do you understand by postage control? But it's majorly, if you can see from my own screen, where I've put it here, it's um, postage control is a ship inspection, is a ship inspection program whereby foreign vessels entering a sovereign state waters are boarded and inspected to ensure compliance with various regulations um, as well. And another definition that you can classify it as, as it's, it's an inspection by a port state control authority at ports and anchorages within that port state jurisdiction on vessels flying flags other than that port state. And this is the purpose of enforcing international standards for maritime safety and security, for maritime pollution. Uh, maritime security, I've mentioned that. But more importantly, um, for onboard living conditions and, of course, the maritime environment protection. So when I'm trying to emphasize on um, inspections that are done on vessels flying other flags apart from the, the particular port. What I mean um, by example is, for instance, if a UK vessel is entering into another state, they will be subjected to a port state control inspection. For instance, another instance might be if a Nigerian vessel is entering another state, it is subjected to a post state control inspection. But even with me saying that, it doesn't mean that for every foreign port that you go to, you are required to carry out a post state control inspection. No, because there are intervals and there are regimes that the post state control will use in determining whether an inspection will be carried out on that particular vessel. And it's in a more interesting fact um, because the whole Cosmo and the whole context is being designed in such a way that information can be shared across various parties based on whatever memorandum of understanding that we are dealing with. So as well, when you ask this question, it's very, very important to note that what's that the postage inspectors going on board the vessels are looking at making sure that your ship complies, I mean, sorry, complies with major and um, various um, standard, international standard. And with this international standard are uh, not limited to SOLAS, MAPO, SCCW, your ISM, your tonnage, your co reg your civil liability. If I've not mentioned MLC, MLC, um, load line, um, Palace Water Convention, if you are a party to it, the anti-fouling system um, as well. So we have major several, it's cut across several international convention and codes that has been put out by the IMO. And what these guys are saying, are you really complying with these regulations too um, as well? So now let's now move into it proper. I have been able to define, I've been able to define what postage control is. And I've been able to explain what I understand and what we should understand by um, a postage control um, inspection. And an example like I've just given to you is a UK vessel is subjected to postage control inspection in another state party to the uh, memorandum of understanding except the UK itself. A Nigerian vessel is subjected 
to a post state control inspection in another um, state party to the to the memorandum uh, inspection. For the purpose of this lecture, I will be dwelling more on the Paris Memorandum of Understanding, the, that which is majorly called the Paris um, MOU. But I will also show you more other MOUs that we have, that mean that are popular and are being um, used to as well. So let's move on. Um, after even giving you a full description, so as well. Comparison of ship inspected, ships with deficiencies, and ship detailed, like for instance, are put in Canada here. And the reason why I've been able to put this is because when a port state control carries out inspection on your ship, they have the right, even though they are not flag state of your ship, even though they are not your classification society, classification society, they don't even detain anyway. But the postage control has the right. They are not the owner of your vessel. They are not the flag of your vessel. They are just another um, port jurisdiction because you enter their ports. But they have the right actually to detain your vessel. If you get what I mean, they have the right to detain your vessel. So if you can see the rate at which inspections are being put out, if you can see the rate of deficiencies, and this is a picture from a major port like Canada, and then you can see the rate of, um, of deten detention too as well. A practical example, I remember very far back, 2010, 11, I think 11, while I was a cadet, a Nigerian tanker left the Nigerian Lagos, we call it Lagos outside bar, which is of course known as the Lagos Anchor, and proceeded to Takura the Tema. I know this tanker a lot in Nigeria, and the Nigerian um, ship owners were very complacent in the way they do things, and they were not actually complying. As of that time, it was the ILO um, convention, and there was no proper living conditions and working conditions on board. But you know what? They got down to um, to Ghana, and the Ghana Maritime Authority, through the postage control, carried out inspections on this vessel. And they actually found out that, no, this vessel has actually not been complying with the MLC convention. And they detained the vessel. Yes, the vessel was registered under NIMASA. Yes, they were just visiting the Ghana, um, Ghana Takura Depot. But Ghana Authority detained the vessel. Ghana Maritime Authority bought provisions for the crew on the vessel. Ghana Maritime Authority painted the all of the vessel and make sure the vessel was in good living condition. And then the Ghana Maritime Authority asked the ship owner that in order to take their vessel out of their port, they will need to pay every single money that they spent on the vessel. And of course, you know that just those money will come with interest as well. They're not just going to buy for instance, um, a bottle of water of one pound or 100 naira, and then they will say the company should bring 100 naira. No, there will always be a premium. So this is the jurisdiction or the power that the post state control has when they are trying to enforce um, compliance of international legislation. I'm sure you're, I'm sure you're following me um, too. So now let's kind of uh, move on we will see that there are several inspection type. There are several inspection type, but the ones that you will find most of these um, ports doing, like I said, I've just picked one of the ports. It's a more, we have the more detailed inspection, which I'll go into later on. You have the expanded inspection as well. And there are inspections that are coming out of overriding factors to or your inspection that just because you are just a tanker, they will carry out some inspection on your vessel. Now, I just want to move on. Like most of us here, we Nigerians too um, in this class. So majorly in West Africa and Central Africa, we have what we call the Abuja MOU. So the Abuja MOU there is majorly for the West and Central Africa Memorandum of Understanding in the port state control. And that is why you could see in that example that I gave you a Nigerian tanker leaving Nigeria to go visit Akora Ditema, and it was arrested there. 
we have the Black Sea Memorandum of Understanding. And when you hear Black, you must, you must hear something like Russia, Romania, Georgia, Ukraine, and all those things. The Caribbean as well, Indian, Mediterranean. But the most interesting one, the most interesting one, and I must really say the, most, the one that has the greatest structure in place is the Paris Memorandum of Understanding, which I will be dwelling more here because I see most of the examiners, especially the UK examiners, kind of gel more on the Paris Memorandum of Understanding. So what does this Paris Memorandum of Understanding, what does it say? And I'm just gonna go more into it without um, having um, to go through with this slide so that I can pinpoint everything I wanna say. So for Paris Memorandum of Understanding, as of the last time I checked, there are 27 member states this Paris Memorandum of, um, of Understanding. And the way it works, the way it, the Paris Memorandum of Understanding works, first of all, they categorize, I repeat, they categorize the black states into three. Every state are categorized into three. And this, don't nobody should um, mistake me for the IMO white list or blacklist because I'm about to go into this now. I should do, I don't want to, to be mistaken. I don't want to mistake it for that. But these three categories are the blacklist, the white list, and the gray list. And this is very, very important because the examiners, I see one of the exam questions and they come in and say, okay, the flag state are the categorized in the Paris Memorandum of Understanding and boom. Yes, the idea is not just coming up because the student was not able to just comprehend that this is what they're talking about. So what does this black list mean? Black lists are flags with significant, I repeat, significant worse than average detention record. So like for instance, now I give an initial example of a Nigerian tanker proceeding from Nigeria going down to Ghana. And Ghana Maritime Authority arrested this tanker. It's going to be on the record, on the, on the memorandum of understanding to say that one tanker from Nigeria is already arrested. So when you have multiple tankers and numerous tankers being arrested, also I'm not just going to be in a lot of by just speaking tankers, but various types of vessels, as long as it's registered under Nigeria and is arrested by another port state control. It's always automatically, it's not just negotiable, it's not negotiable, but it's automatically um, brings down the reputation of the Nigerian flag. And it goes down, it can go as worse as being black. And black is worse than average detention record. Now, from the black, which is the worst, to the gray. Gray is, is just average. We have neither bad, we have neither worse nor better um, detention, detention rate. So let's just say for, for instance now, um, let's leave Nigeria and let's go down to Togo. Um, they might not be having so much detention rates as much as Nigeria, or, or either way, it might even be Togo having more detention rates than Nigeria. But what I'm just trying to say is this flag state themselves, I mean, the new flag states, maybe another flag state, they might be having detention rates, but it's not as worse as those in black and the black states. So we have the black states, like I said, they are worse than average detention rate. Then we have the gray lists. The gray flag lists are those ones who are average. And then we have the ones where everybody wants to be, which is the white list. Now this white list, they are flags with significant better than average detention um, record. So like for instance, I'm going to just speak, not that I'm giving preference to, um, to UK, but I really see that their standards are really high. But they, if for instance, they do not have much tankers or much vessels. I don't know why I keep saying tankers, but they do not have much vessels being detained by other port states um, control or in other port states and port state jurisdiction. You will really find them on the white list. So the question is now, wherever country you're connecting from, are you is your country going to be on the black list, the white list, or the gray list? And the interesting part of this story is it's not hidden. If we just Google WW, if you just Google, sorry. Paris, uh, Paris MOU, um, you open their website and you can find all this information um, there too. And this helps, this helping 
ensuring or this helps in making you make a decision whether you want to put your vessels under this flag or under this flag or what you'll be expecting if for instance you are uh, yes you are putting your vessel under a black list flag state moving on moving on i would like to talk about the regime or i mean another very important factor in the port state control which is the risk factor now every single ship every single ship and i repeat every single ship are divided into three every single ship are divided into three as uh, as long as the port state control inspection is concerned your ship can either be categorized under the iric ship your ship can either be categorized under the standard rig ship and your ship can be be categorized under the low rig ship and the reason why i'm saying this is for instance if you want to go down to under the paris memorandum um, memorandum of understanding you enter into one of their their member states um, as well if your vessel is a high rig ship you will be facing more inspection regime and you'll be facing inspection between five to six months but before I go into that, which I will still come back to again, and I'll repeat it again, I need to first say that how I need to first explain to us how is it your vessel becomes either an high risk vessel or a standard risk vessel or a low risk vessel. And you yourself, even after this class or after watching the video, you can go around, go to the Paris of one of understanding and put in these details which I'm about to say now, and you will find out whether your vessel is actually a high risk ship. A standard risk and a low risk. I remember I told you, I started by saying, high risk, you face more intervals of more frequent intervals of inspection. A low risk ship, you face lesser intervals of inspection, obviously, because you are low. And why do we, why is this risk factor important, the high risk, the standard risk, and the low risk? It's because it will determine the one respective priority for the inspection. It will determine, like I earlier said, the intervals between inspections. And then three, it will even now determine the scope of inspection. The scope of you um, inspecting a low risk vessel will be totally different or to some, to some extent completely different to the scope at which you will be inspecting a high risk vessel, especially a tanker that is like 30 or 40 years old. You are not going to inspect that, inspect a PSV that was just um, uh, built last two months, the same way you're going to be inspecting uh, inspecting that. And I'll, I, might, I will go further into that. But also, I need us to just understand, which is another vital um question that uh, it's on most of the oral now how do you determine if your vessel is on the risk i mean if your vessel is a low risk standard risk or um high risk and that's another question and this is determined with what i used to call the t a p p p n so it's t a p p p n so in determining the risk level of a vessel and using the Paris Memorandum of Understanding, like I said, you go down to the Paris Memorandum of Understanding, there is what you call a risk profile calculator. And using the risk profile calculator is also called a thesis. It's determined by one, a T, which is the type of the ship. So what type of the ship? Is it a container vessel? Is it um, a tanker vessel? Is it a, P, is it a PSV? Is it an LNG? So you put in the type of the vessel first. Then secondly, TA, age, the age of the vessel. How long is the, how old is this vessel? Is it 10 years? Because no, you need to know, it's just the same like your car. If you buy a brand new car today and you buy a Tokumbo car, I, I use the word Tokumbo, like a second hand car that has been operational for like 15 years, you will not expect the same productivity from both of them. You will not expect the same rate of maintenance from both of them. You will not even expect the same rate of output from both of them. And even in terms of safety as well. So the age of the vessel, I started by saying the type of the vessel, the age of the vessel. Then thirdly, the performance of the, of the flag. 
you know, I started off by trying to describe to you the types of flag states that we have. We have one, the black, um, black list, we have the gray list, and then we have the white list. So which flag are you um, as well? Which, which flag are you being put under? So, um, I mean, are you categorized under? Then the performance of your classification society, because we have Lloyd's, we have um, so we have Lloyd, we have DMV, GL, we have um, ABS, we have RENA. The, the performance of your classification society also will help in, when you are putting all this in the risk factor, it will help in determining what risk your vessel is. Also, the performance of the company responsible for the ISM management. What are their performance? Their own vessels, have they been arrested? Are they having so many deficiencies? Because the more deficiencies, the more arrests, you will see that their risk factor just keep increasing um, too as well. Then of course, even for the vessel itself, the numbers of, of detention and deficiencies in the past 36 months, how long it has been detained? I mean, how many times has it been detained? How many times has it been uh, as he had so much deficiencies in that past 36 months. And all this puts together, all this puts together will help you in determining a risk factor for the vessel. But it's not you that will determine it, it's the Paris Memorandum of Understanding Risk Calculator that will, um, that will determine it for you um, as well. So when we have, uh, when we have just, when we have the, um, the risk factor, are you high risk, are you low risk, are you standard risk, they will now come in to say that for a high risk, your vessel must be inspected between five and six months inter um, at interval in the Paris Memorandum of Understanding region. For standard risk vessel, your vessel must be inspected between 10 to 12 months. And then for the low risk vessel, your vessel must be inspected between 24 and 36 months between 24 and 36 months. So meaning that any outside ports that you visit outside your own flag state, your vessel will be inspected either between 24 and 36 if you are low risk and between 10 to 12 months if you are standard risk and between five and six months if you are, um, if you are an high risk vessel. And this is what we call the periodic inspection. However, however, even though you have just been inspected by another port state and you just move into another port state's um, jurisdiction, and of course you will be claiming you don't need to be inspected, especially if you are a low risk person, you've just been inspected last month. So you don't need to be inspected for the next 24 months. There are other things that you name as the additional inspection. And additional inspection is what we classify as inspection that can be triggered by what we call overriding or unexpected factors, depending on the severity of the occurrence. So like for instance, if you mess up with your pilots, if your pilot sees that your vessel is not um, seaworthy, if you are having any accident or incidents while approaching the port or so, if you are carrying dangerous goods, if you are becoming, if they are deemed to, if you are deemed or suspected to be a navigational hazard, all these things put in place, you will find out that you might be prone to another additional um, inspection. So let's come back to our slide now and let's see where I've been missing. So now, now that you've really been able to understand your intervals between when your vessel is to be inspected, because it is very, very important, especially if you are trading internationally and you're going from one port to the other, you need to know if you're an IRIS vessel, you need to also make sure that every six to, so every five and six months, your vessel must be inspected. And I tell you, how will I know this risk factor? On the Paris Memorandum of Understanding, you can Google it and then it will just, it's a very, it's a free website. You put in all this and it just shows you your vessel, if your vessel is a low risk, high risk or a standard risk. Now, what are you supposed to do? Because like I said, for all the abuse, this comes to you now. What are your obligations? What are your responsibilities? For vessels, especially like I'm dwelling on the Paris Memorandum of Understanding Port, which are due for an expanded inspection, which I will go into now, what I what a class as expanded inspection, you must give a 72 hours notice 
pre-arrival notification. I'm going to touch on what is expanded inspection just now, but also other vessels, like for instance, any other vessels that are not for expanded inspection, but are due for a normal inspection, they have to give at least a 24 hours pre-arrival notice. So if, for instance, you are going into another port and you know that you are due for an, a post-it inspection and you cannot say that you don't know because it's out there on the public domain for you to access, you must give a 24 hours, um, 24 hours notice. And these are all under the Paris Memorandum of Understanding. I take Paris Memorandum of Understanding because most of the lectures and most of the exams normally come under this Paris Memorandum of Understanding. You can see Tokyo and all others as well. Now, coming, before I go into criteria for, for, sorry, for detaining a ship, by the post-it control um, officers. I would like to talk about the types of inspections that these post-it control officers will come and carry on board. Carrying out an inspection on board, they can carry out, there are three types of inspection that you'll be required to be carried out, or you may be required to be carried out under the Paris, uh, under the post-it control. The first one is what I know as the initial, excuse me, sorry, the initial inspection. And this initial inspection is a very simple inspection that as long as you can just pass this inspection, you are free. But this initial inspection is not as simple because it will also comprise of checking of your certificate, checking of your documents, and you know, and those documents are also listed in the Paris Memorandum of Understanding um, um, checklist too. They will always come with their checklist. So they will check whether, they will check your document to ensure ISM compliance. They will check your document to ensure ISPS compliance. They will check your documents to ensure FLC compliance. They will check your documents to ensure tonnage compliance. They will check your documents to ensure ballast water um, ballast water management compliance. They will check your documents to ensure the Nairobi Rec Removal Convention compliance. They will check your documents to ensure um, co-rec compliance. They will check your documents to ensure solar compliance. And the list goes on and on. They might even do sampling or they might want to check everything. It's up to them. But this is just the initial um, inspection um, that will carry out. Then after that, they will now check your overriding, this is still under initial inspection. They will, they will check your overall condition of the um, of the vessel. How is the vessel, the hygiene of the vessel? And this was what led to that arrest that I gave in the beginning in Takura the ports um, too, as well. They will check your navigational bridge. Are you having enough navigational um, equipment? They will check your accommodation and garden. They might even want to have lunch with you. And let's see whether there will be food poisoning or what's going on with the galley too, um, as well. They will check your deck for safety. They will check cargoes, cargo holes, the engineering. But all these things that they are checking is just to basically see, are you actually complying with the international um, rules and, and, and standards too, um, as well? And also under the initial, I'm still talking about initial, like I said, there are three types of inspection. Uh, under the initial, they will check, do you have any previous deficiencies that has not been closed out? Or if there's any previous deficiencies that you might have been, let's say for instance, you are a low risk vessel and then they gave you one deficiency last three months in Las Palmas or in Tokyo, and then you are entering Port Las uh, Vegas and you have not closed that one out, then you are just in for kind of a bigger trouble, which is the next inspection called the detailed inspection. Now, what is detailed inspection? However, I must really say, put a disclaimer that the inspector also might just move from, see, I'm not going just to just check the brief um, document and blah, blah, blah. I'm actually want to check. I'm actually going for a detailed inspection. But another inspection, another ins um, inspector will be required to, okay, just check the initial. And if they find any, any problem, they will now go down to the detailed. And what exactly is detailed inspection? Now, detailed inspection is carried out if the inspector has a clear ground to believe that after an initial inspection or just overall of looking about the overall side of the vessel or holistically looking at the vessel, you know, the condition of the ship and its equipment does not meet the requirements of one or two conventions. So, for instance, 
I, get, I go back to that example that I started with in the beginning of this lecture, which is the vessel that was detained in Ghana in Takoradi Tema. So um, Ghana, is it in Takoradi or in Tema? And what they were just looking for was just seeing a breach of the MLC or seeing a breach of the working and living conditions of the crew then they will now carry that is from an initial inspection by the way and they will carry out what i call a detailed inspection um so so now this detailed inspection now will now be more on oh i've seen a loophole in the mlc so i need to check your full mlc compliance and this is where they'll go full in or i've seen um a loophole in your ism uh yeah in your ism standard on board it's not up to standard then they will go fully into your ism checking your smc checking your doc and so many other things as well i think one of the classes they will treat another question which is how do you prepare for an ism audit how do you prepare for an isps audit to them um, as well but this is what we're talking about and they might holistically go into two or three different conventions and what this convent, what we, what we, um, what this thing, what this um, detailed inspection will comprise is detailed inspection on where this clear ground is established. So, for, like for instance, MLC, a detailed inspection on that on the old MLC side. And if, for instance, also another thing on detailed inspection is if, for instance, like I told you, there is what we call the periodic inspection and the um, additional inspection. So this additional inspection might be overriding factors. So for instance, if you had an accident while you're entering into the ports, you might be prone for um, additional inspection. An additional inspection, the inspector will not go into initial. It will just go straight down to details. You hit, you hit my ports, I'm gonna check everything around your vessels or what, it, um, what, what has led to blah, blah, blah. So this detailed inspection will check to areas relating to the overriding or unexpected um, factors. Then after they have done that, they will now randomly check, uh, maybe, okay, let's look at another convention with your water types, your LSA, your dangerous goods, your solars, your STCW. So I, just, I need us to understand this thing that detailed inspection is really based, is carried out more on where the uh, on where the clear grounds has been established. It's carried out more on where they have found a loophole in that convention. Now, if for any reason, if for any reason they've gone down and they've checked the MLC, they've done an overall view and they found one little mistake in your MLC, they did another detailed one in the old MLC and randomly, and they still found more loopholes, they will now go into what I call an expanded inspection. They'll go into what I call what an expanded inspection. Now, this expanded inspection will now carry out everything on the vessel. And this is more of a brutal inspection. They'll carry out all the inspections on the vessel, carry out of all conventions, all codes on the vessel, all regulations. Um, Everything. So starting from the structural to the fire to the alarm to LSS to DG to ISPS to ISM to MLC to the proportional system to the water type system to the documentation system to the structural system, every single thing, balance water management system as well. This is what I now call an expanded inspection. This question actually made me feel 2015. When I didn't know the idea, I mean, I didn't have an idea of what an expanded inspection was. But later, going down the line to have a read, I will never forget what an expansion inspect an expanded inspection is. And an expanded inspection is an intense inspection. I repeat, an intense inspection, and it's required for sheep. After going through a detailed inspection, and they still found more grounds, we go to an expanded. However, it is not limited to that. Now, there's a clear fact: vessels that are high risk profile vessels, they automatically go under expanded inspection. So low risk vessels, I mean, standard risk vessels don't have to go to, into expanded inspection. High risk vessel will go into an expanded inspection. So if you are an high risk vessel, by any chance, when you are going internationally, as per this slide that I'm showing you on my screen, 
you must give a 72 hours pre-arrival notice. Also, gas tanker, oil tanker, chemical tankers of more than 12 years expanded inspection straight every time they are carrying out. So they might, the gas tanker might be low risk or might be standard risk, but as long as they are more than 12 years, they must carry out expanded inspection um, too. Then, like I told you about overriding factors to any ship with above overriding factors, we go straight into expanded inspection. Then also, if they arrest your vessel, if your vessel has been detained or your vessel has been banned from entering a port for the, for the refusal of that, for the lifting of that refusal of access notice, they will carry out an expanded, um, expanded inspection. And I tell you, an expanded inspection is detailed, is, is broad. It goes straight right into, um, into the vessel too as well. But which is another thing that is very important, especially for the old WS and this class where we're talking about the part uh, the uh, post state control, what's your responsibility? Of course, you make sure that if a pre-arrival notice is given, especially if your vessel is an expanding inspection, if your vessel is due for an expanding inspection because it's oil tanker, gas tanker, chemical tanker of more than 12 years old, or it's an IRIS vessel, you and it's due for an expanded inspection, you must give a 72 hours. Um, 72 hours notice too um, as well. Now let's let's go down to seeing criteria that really warrants a post state control officer to detain a vessel. And the main criteria is the main criteria they're using is if they deem that this vessel see this vessel is unsafe to proceed to sea. And that the deficiencies of the ship are considered serious by the inspector, if we detain the vessel. And this these deficiencies can be I mean these are must be rectified. Before, because you will see the plastic, you say it must be rectified before the vessel can sail again. That's the first before the vessel. Now, if for instance, you just visited a port, maybe to even just take bunker, that's not even the port you are going to, and you are prone for a post and they arrest the vessel, you must sail. This is no matter whether you are visiting or where you get to the next port. And in the annual report of Paris Memorial, it will be stated there as the major um, deficiencies. Now, other deficient, major deficiencies that can lead to that is, of course, certification of the crew. You carry crew, you don't have certificate. You carry a master who is less than 3,000 NCVs, and you're telling him to say a vessel of 15,000 gross tonnage down to Japan. My friend, you have just committed a major blunder. You have not complied with the SCCW uh, um, convention. Safety. What are the safety programs? They, uh, do these guys, do they have coveralls on board? Is there, is, there, is there a safe margin? Are they carrying a proper risk assessment? Are they following the risk assessment that you know that they are really comp uh, complying with? Is there a proper safety management system in place? And are they complying with it as well? Maritime security is there adequate ISPS code being followed too. Maritime pollution, MAPO, they don't joke with this one. It's, are you are you just are you carrying a proper, uh, are you adhering to the proper MAPO convention? Is there any leakage from your vessels? And so working and living conditions, I know Ghana Maritime Authority for one, because this is an example I picked. They don't joke with that too. MCA, they don't joke with that um, as well. Operational management side of it, management, are they providing the adequate support that they're supposed to be providing too um, as well? So these major de um, deficiencies that you see now, a major deficiencies that yes, that will give them grounds for them to actually arrest a vessel. I've really touched on this, but you can see from my screen. An instant inspection is just like to check the certificates of the, I mean, check certificate and documents, and it's found in the an extent of the of the Paris Memorandum on, of, of Understanding. And like I told you, that initial inspection is just like you know the first inspection that they will try and carry out for a low risk and a standard risk um, vessel. And then after they see that, oh, there's still some grounds that, no, this guy is messing up in one place, or they are seeing more than one loopholes in some place, and there's clear ground, then they go deep into it too as well. Detailed inspection is a more depth ex examination, and you can see what they can really check. Other areas they can check at random will be, you know, documentation, structural uh, condition, the emergency system, the fire system, the alarm, working on living conditions. They don't joke with that. Um, the navigational equipment, and they're just taking into account the INO, the ISM, the SCCW, the ISPS too, um, too as well. So the uh, PSC requirements upon detaining a vessel, yeah, if uh, PSC will require a vessel being detained 
to remedy the deficiency which caused the, the detention. We've spoken about this. And the ship becomes free of detention only when all the fee induced by the inspection and detention is paid by the ship owner. And that goes back again to that example that I said. The, the, the Ghana authority even took a step higher to try and make sure that the vessel kind of meets the standard and living conditions um, for crew to be on board. But they actually asked the ship owner to pay. So you pay for all those inspections, you pay for any cost that they have incurred on the, I mean, you have incurred on vessels um, too, as well. Then, of course, to be honest, honestly, no port, no port or ship owner, of course, obviously, wants. Um, the vessel to be detained for a long time for the ship owner because it will lose business, but for the ports because it will take a lot of space and there will be no um, space for other vessels to come. They are losing; they will be losing money too um, as well. So there is, of course, a time uh, of detention, and you do not want to provoke the flag state because the more you leave your vessel in detention, I've actually seen ship owners leaving vessel in detention for a long time, and actually. That gives the posted control grounds to even sell off the vessel, which was what was threatened to um, um, as well. Um, other things like the checklist that will be found. This is the checklist that mostly they use, especially for a map. It's more of checking the oil water separator, the IOPP. Majorly, are you complying with the map convention too? Then. This I was going to ask us to, to have a drill on this. This is how a postage control comes on board. And this is what you check. Is relevant documentation regarding the SMS in working language. So for instance, is it the English language? So if for instance it is in Russian language, there's problem. And or if it's in English, if it's in Russian language and there's an English man on board, there's a big problem. Now, if it's in um, English language and a Russian captain cannot read it, there's a bigger problem. Are you carrying out drills on board as per the drill metrics? If the drill, if the drills are not um, showing that you're carrying, I mean, sorry, the drill records are not showing that you're carrying out drills as per the drill metric, they will hold the vessel down. They will not start checking. Let's check your drill metrics. Let's check what your ISM um, says about it. They might even ask you, let's do a drill. If they do a drill, they'll find out, oh, the crew cannot even put out a fire. That's even a major hazard. That even shows that the vessel is not, is not seaworthy as well. Are you also, is there evidence of effective maintenance system? These are practical demonstrations. So when you are preparing for a post state control audit, these are things that you need to check. And when you are trying to answer the, 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 the questions about post state control, these are things that you should bear in mind as well. Is there proper familiarization um, is there proper familiarization for the crew? I remember P and O some, some months ago, the vessel was detained by the MCA because they found out that there was no proper familiarization by the crew on these vessels as well. And also, very really important for the ISM is did the crew, do they understand the SMS? Are they able to communicate? Are they able to do what the SMS says? And are they actually following the procedures too as well? So that leads me to the five. Are the crew members able to communicate effectively in the execution of duties related to the SMS? So these are, yeah, these are all the in depth of, of, of a PSC, but majorly, I would really say that a PSC, the, the PSC inspector doesn't just come to just look for trouble. No, the last thing I said here, a detention of a ship by PSC can, I mean, it's self-induced deficiency. It's not a deficiency, whereas, you know, an economic downfall caused it or there was weather. No, self-induced deficiency. And even whether it's unforeseeable or un unexpected, as long as you have time, you did not do it, it will lead to a detention um, too as well. So that, that ends my lecture on, on post posted control too. A um, few other things, but it's my notes. I don't want to compare your, your head too much with, with that. Um, uh, any questions? I hope that was clear. Okay, I'm seeing some text here. Yeah. Yeah, life at sea. Yeah, please go ahead. Okay, um, good evening, sir. Good evening.
Okay. Um, thank you very much for the lecture. It was really enlightening. So I just wanted to ask the Abuja MOU, you made mention of the area of coverage that the Abuja MOU covers. I just want to get that straight. For the um, Abuja MOU, yeah, that's, yes, covers the um, East, and East, West, and Africa, I mean, East, West, and Central Africa. I'm just going to go back again to here. Uh, yeah, so that's why West and Central Africa um, too. So those are the places, of course, West Africa, we have, we have, we have ourselves, um, Nigeria, Central Africa. So yeah. Uh, ports around that region, that's where you see it's covered. Okay, thank you, sir. That's fine. That's fine. Thank you. Um, any other, any other person? So, like, um, coming back to you, signatories to those, to those guys, um, to the Abuja MOU. I know Bene, Bene is there. Congo, Cote d'Ivoire, Gabon. Ghana, <laughs> Nigeria, of course, um, Senegal, Syria, Lung, um, Gambia, Togo, um, um, yeah, I've mentioned Syria, Lung, Namibia, Namibia is there, and of course, yeah, South Africa, we have South Africa, we have Guinea, um, Guinea there, we have Cote d'Ivoire, and yeah, some, some, some few other countries are, are actually part of the, and there's this Mauritania, um, too, as well, surprisingly, they are part of the the, the Abuja MOU, but yeah, it's it's really a, a nice one, and you can even you can even Google it. There's um I think it's um, Abuja MOU dot org. It's not com. It's org. Yeah, Abuja MOU. But just Google Abuja MOU, then you really see um see the countries um that are signatories to to it. Well, majorly, if you are able to just picture around the West and Central Africa, you will know. I mean, the West and Central Africa. Just all uh, countries that are within that jurisdiction, too, as well. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank, thanks. Thanks, everyone. Um, next week, I'm bringing, I call her my boss, and she is a very interesting, she has a very interesting story. Um, a mastermind, a female, I mean, Nigerian first female mastermind. And that story is always inspiring a lot. And she will be communistic and giving us a very lovely um, lecture, mostly. But I will communicate to us what the topic will be. For the guys doing the uh, exams today, I want to wish you all guys best of luck. I'm still waiting for feedback. I love the feedback and I love positive feedback. Um, also, there was um, someone who did his captain master minor license today and he passed and he was so happy. Um, thanks, Captain Pistara, for prepping me. Uh, but it was, it was really lovely. I just love to see more people with more good news. So, if you're having orals anytime soon, please, please, please feel free, drop me a chat. Let's try and talk it out. I'm not trying to find out whether you know this or that. I just want to find out how you express your answers too, and we'll see how we work together as well. And anyone, if you have any, any issues at all, please drop it in the chat. There are so many captains in the chat that we answer you privately. No problem. Message me from the chat box to privately. And I'll be so, so, so happy to um, assist. It's not just for um, not just for exam purpose, but I also love to see growth. We also love to see growth on all aspects. So please, please, and please, career confusion. I remember I once in my life, I was so confused in my career. And I actually wanted to opt out of C. But I thank God I had lovely mentors that was able to, you know, bring my head back to normal. So if you have any confusion with career, please, 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 um, don't be an island. Um, the Bible says in the multitude of counsel, there is safety. So, reach out also to us too as well. Well, thank you. On that note, I will say have a lovely night, have a lovely week, and see you back on Tuesday next week as well.
Yeah, good night, sir. God bless you. Good night, sir. Good night, sir. Good night. Yeah, good night. Bye bye. Yeah.